This is Edward October, host of October Pod on YouTube. Hear that jingle jingle? It could be Kris Kringle, or a home invader looking for an open window, a jilted lover looking for revenge, or a disgruntled co-worker hoping to spike your eggnog with arsenic. The girls of our true crime podcast are always on Santa's nice list, but the crimes they discuss are very naughty indeed. Listener discretion is advised. Well, hello there, Jen. Hey, how are you, Kim? I am just wonderful is what it is. I'm just wonderful. Let me tell you right Woo-hoo. now. Just wonderful. That mm-hmm. makes me happy. You know why? Why? Because this is day 11. <laughs> day, we have one more to go. One I know. more of our 12 nightmares before the holidays. Can you believe that we are drawing to the close the fourth annual no. 12 nightmares fourth before Christmas? Annual? The 412. No, nope, It's amazing, isn't it? It is amazing. I it can't amazing, believe actually. we've uh, actually accomplished it again. Mm-hmm. Every year I get amazed. Jen, we have that one we more did it. episode to go, I think. So let's not, let's, <laughs> it, it could, you <laughs> never know. Okay, yeah, you you're right. You're never right. know. On September the 15th, 1990, people were taking a nice little walk along a river near Prague, when they stumbled up to what they thought was a mannequin. As they got closer, they realized it was the body of a young woman. Her body, nude, was left in a very extreme, vulgar display, shall we say. Mm -hmm. Her stockings were wrapped around her neck. The killer had tried to cover her up with leaves and debris as if to hide his crime. The woman would turn out to be Blanca Bakova. Blanca had went out the night before with friends to have drinks. The group decided to leave just before midnight, but Blanca was having a blast and she didn't want to go. So she decided to stay for just one more. Her friends would say she was talking with a man who looked to be around 40 years of age, but that's all the information that they could provide. What authorities could not yet know was that there was an international serial killer and he was just getting started, but he was no stranger to police. Ooh. Now, with this being international, Jen, you know, I have problems with words, as do you. And name, names especially. Well, names, yes. And so this crime takes place in Prague, Austria, Los Mm -hmm. Angeles. It kind of goes a lot of places. So what you're saying is there might be some mispronunciations of words? Yes. And for Mm -hmm. that, I wholeheartedly apologize. Yes, we do try the best we can. We try. We try. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody's perfect. We try spectacularly and we fail spectacularly. That's right. That's Mm -hmm. right. Here's a little background info for you, Jen. Sex work is legal in Austria and has mm-hmm. been for centuries. As it should workers, be here. Mm-hmm. Workers actually register with the state, and that helps regulate the industry. Sex workers have even been paying taxes since 1986. The field of work may be accepted more in Austria than anywhere else, but it remains a dangerous pursuit for all. Sex workers often work late at night, and they're willing to get into a stranger's car and venture off into the night. For this prolific killer, these women were his prey, and it would take years and four countries to figure out just who was killing these women. In the fall of 1990, a sex worker named Brunhild Masser from Graz went missing. On December 5th, 1990, Heidi Marie Hammerer was reported as missing as well. Heidi had been working the city of Brigens, again, I apologize if I'm saying these wrong, for over 10 years. So she had been around a long time and she'd seen quite a bit. It would be just over three weeks until Heidi's body would be located 10 miles away from the area in which she was working. A couple out enjoying a New Year's Eve hike would discover Heidi 
and due to frigid temperatures, her body had remained pretty much intact. Officers arrive on the scene and determine Heidi had been strangled by her own pantyhose. She had bruising around her wrist, indicating that she had been restrained. Fibers, believed not from her clothing, were also found on her. The killer left no semen behind. And let me say here, some of the articles that I've read Mm. had said pantyhose were used to choke some of the victims and others said a bra. I'm going with what I believe to be more accurate, I guess. I had gotcha. to, okay. It could be Just all the like, translation too, right? It, it really could. It really, right. That's actually a good point, like undergarments. Mm-hmm. That's a good point, Jen. Just like the murder of Blanca that occurred in Prague, Heidi had been covered with leaves and debris, and although not nude, her legs were spread wide open on purpose. It looked as if Heidi had been redressed by the killer. Now, this was different than the last time where they, the killer purposely left the body nude. A scrap of her slip was found shoved inside her mouth. Her body was then dragged through the woods and left off to the side. Also, just like Blanca, Heidi had been strangled with her own tights. She, too, had injuries to her wrist, indicating she had been tied up police identified some red fibers on her clothing that they believe was left by the killer. Only a few days after this, the body of Brunhild Masser was discovered in some nearby woods. The manner of death mirrored Blanca and Heidi's murders. Since Blanca's murder took place in Prague, the Austrian police believed they were working two similar murders, not three. They had not put together that Blanca's murder was also connected. Since the victims were, or they believe at this point, to be sex workers, they are finding it difficult to get any evidence. The victims were thought to go with their killer willingly, and no one seemed to have witnessed anything. Things would heat up on March 7th, 1991, when sex worker, and I'm going to apologize for this name, Alfred Schrempf went missing. This time, her parents called police to report her missing, but had some more information. They tell officers that a man had been calling them and berating them about their daughter being a sex worker. Somebody was badgering them about her being a sex worker. That's so odd. People suck. What's interesting to note here is that the family's phone number was unlisted. So the person had to have knowledge of the phone number and of their daughter, meaning this possibly could be the person who took her. Her body would be found on October 5th, 1991. Just like the other, she was found in a wooded area outside Graz and covered in leaves and debris. This killer would strike again four more times, but in Vienna this time rather than Austria. On May 20th, a man is taking a walk when he smelled something awful. Now, he's believing that there had to be a rotting animal carcass nearby. Mm. So he starts shuffling his feet around the forest floor, you know, to stir up the leaves and the dirt. To his shock, he stumbled onto and over a body. The young woman had her shirt pulled up around her shoulders. She was positioned face down with her legs spread wide open. Again, just like the others, she had been strangled using her own tights. The victim was 25-year-old Sabine Matsi. Her husband had called police a month prior to report his wife missing. Now, Sabine was a bit different, but also the same as the other victims. And I'll explain this. Sabine, you see, had a little bit of a secret. By day, she worked at a bakery. But at night, she started working the streets. Her husband did not know this nor did he know that she had developed an addiction to heroin. Her friend would tell police that she had dropped Sabine off at around 11 p.m. on April 16th near the West train station. Her friend went down, you know, turned around, and when she was driving back past, Sabine had already been picked up, so within mere minutes. Three days later, on May 23rd, another woman named Karen Eroglu was found by a passerby. Karen had disappeared from her usual corner that she worked on May 7th, but was dumped deep into the woods. 
Her face showed the injuries her killer had given her just before he strangled her with her leotard she had been wearing. The killer was given the moniker Vienna Woods Killer, but he was not finished yet. It was also apparent that Vienna had a serial killer. With two other missing sex workers, authorities feared the worst. Police hit the streets talking to sex workers and pimps alike, asking questions that may shed some light on customers who may have been around them, maybe gave them a weird feeling or Mm -hmm. did something unusual. They know. They can feel it out. They've been around it enough. They've been doing this for a long time. Right. Nearly two weeks after the body of Karen had been discovered, a man by the name of Jack Unterweger arrived at police headquarters requesting an interview with the police chief, Max Edelbacher. He told the chief that he was a freelance journalist who was working on a piece for the Austrian Broadcasting Company, or ABC. The piece, entitled The Fear in the Red Light Meal You, would air on June 5th and was broadcast across the entire country. In the piece, Jack talked to sex workers who openly discussed their fears about all the recent murders. One of those listening was none other than the chief's wife. Hmm. And, you know, she had a little bit of info for the chief. That reporter named Jack, he wasn't just a reporter, Jen. In fact, he was famous in and around the country. And he was no stranger to murder. Ooh. Jack was born August 16, 1950, to an American soldier father and an Austrian sex worker mother. He was tossed around by his mother to his grandfather and back again. His criminal ways would start early, pretty simply, by skipping school more than he attended. He was first arrested at 16 years old for attacking a sex worker. He would spend the next decade in and out of the prison system, mostly for assault on women. In 1974, he would finally commit the act that would see him do some serious time. Jack murdered an 18-year-old German teenager by the name of Margaret Schaefer. He strangled Margaret with her own bra and Uh told the judge in court he envisioned his mother as he did it. Jack was sentenced to life in prison for his crime. So you'd think if he's in prison, how is he out riding? We're going to get to that, Jen. I'm glad you asked. I know you didn't ask, but I bet you were thinking. Yeah, I'm kind of wondering about what his mother did to him, too. Mm -hmm. While Jack was in prison, he used his time wisely. Entering the prison system, he was illiterate. He couldn't read or write, but he worked hard to not only learn to read and write, but to learn all he could, especially in the area of literature. He started writing poems, stories, and even plays while he was behind bars. Finally, he wrote his autobiography, which translates in English to Purgatory or The Trip to Prison, Report of a Guilty Man. It was received with critical success, and it was even made into a feature film. Not starring anybody we know, because of course I looked that up. Jack became the celeb du jour while in prison. People lobbied for him to get out because he had such a successful rehabilitation. Uh Austrians in high places wanted him out and protested to get him out. He was giving TV interviews. He was being written up and, you know, just they loved him. You know, everybody likes a good story, right? Everybody Mm -hmm. likes a good makeover. Comeback story. story. Comeback. Mm -hmm. There you go. On May 23rd, 1990, Jack was paroled, having only served 14 years of his life sentence. He was quoted in the press as saying, That life is over now. Let's get on with the new. Jack was the ideal image of redemption. He was given a tough hand, made mistakes, but he was on to bigger and better things. He was just a media darling. The highfalutin smart people loved Mm -hmm. him. (laughs) All because of the book. His books, and he wrote other things. And I guess he was pretty good at it. 
He was met with open arms and lots of money. Just like the celebrity he fashioned himself to be, he played this part well. He loved it. He drove a really nice car with nice clothes, had wads of money, and became a frequent guest on talk shows and a guest of the ritziest parties. He would be, you know, the guest of honor. While working as a freelance writer reporter for the local news station, Jack was winning at life, proving to all that you can make a big mistake and you can redeem yourself. Due to his stellar reporting on the death of the sex workers in Austria, Jack was asked to come to America, Los Angeles to be exact, to profile the industry in and around Los Angeles and the dangers of it, as well as being a police officer in Los Angeles. He was going to be writing some freelance stories there. Jack arrived in town, and he stayed at the famous and infamous Cecil Hotel. Mm. He was a media darling. He would even go on ride-alongs with police officers who were Why would he stay there? That was like for, uh, not for people of his hostile type. It's been kind of scuzzy for a long time. Yeah, exactly. All right. Mm -hmm. If you watch the Netflix, I think it was a four episode series on the Cecil Hotel. They Mm -hmm. mentioned Jack. Jack Oh, they do? Yeah. I must have missed that. Jack would remain in L.A. for just over five weeks and then he returned home. Now, Jen, you know, the strangest thing happened when he was in L.A. During that five week period. Three sex workers were murdered, strangled with their own bras, just like back at home. Huh. What a coincidence. Hmm. It didn't take long for police in Los Angeles, as well as Austria, to start seeing, oh, I don't know, the timelines of the murders and the whereabouts of Jack. Mm -hmm. Not to mention, this is how his first victim died so many years ago. Jack fled. Yep, that's right. He Mm -hmm. ran off. They're on to him. So he runs off to Switzerland, then to Paris. He has a girlfriend in tow with him all this time, too. And then finally, he ends up in Miami. He was arrested in the winter of 1992. And let's just say his arrest was one for the movies, and it played right up to his personality. As I said, he was a media darling blitz. He loved all the attention, right? So... Police, they're going to nab him with a big old fat lie. An officer phoned Jack and he claimed to be a reporter from a magazine and they wanted him to tell his story. They wanted him to tell his story so badly that they would pay him $10,000 to sit down with the magazine for an exclusive interview. They arranged to meet in a hotel. But when Jack walked in, There were police officers, not reporters. They were the ones wanting his story, and they were waiting for him. In May 1992, Jack was extradited back to Austria to stand trial, where he faced charges on the 11 murders, including one in Prague and the three in Los Angeles. The jury found him guilty of nine murders. In June of 1994, psychiatrist Dr. Reinhard Haller diagnosed Jack with, this is a shocker, narcissistic personality disorder. Hmm. We'd never basic, seen that. You never saw that coming, right? Uh, he was hoping that this diagnosis might persuade or sway the jury to maybe go a little bit more lenient. It didn't, of course. On June 29th, 1994, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Jack would say, I cannot bear going back into a cell. I guess not after living the limelight and the Mm -hmm. high life Mm -hmm. for all those years. All that attention. And Jack would make sure he would not. That very night, Jack hanged himself with a rope he fashioned out of a cord from a pair of pants and his shoelaces. And if there were any doubts about his guilt, the knot he used to tie his Mm -hmm. noose was the same type of knot used to strangle all of those sex workers. There you go. And that is the story of Jack, who's not a nice person. Not at all. Not at all. Am I wrong? Authorities were basically pressured to release him. Correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. All he, because he was supposed somebody's to serve life. like, yeah, all because. He's great. He's so redeemed. People and that I'm, come from a celebrity background are like, oh, my God, we have to let him out. 
He's he's so good. good. He's great. That's ridiculous. And I'm sure in his biography, he had, I'm sure he fashioned some story that made him seem like misunderstood and, oh, what was poor Jack? There's a lot more to the story. I thought we Mm -hmm. were kind of doing short episodes because it's Christmas. So I suggest people tune in. There is more to it. I mean, this is, you know, the highlights because I thought we were doing shorter stories, but then Jen's coming in clutch with all these big long ones. (laughs) Well, I don't have a lot of the ones that I've done so far have been very big, well-known stories because like I said, the higher you go up, the more notable the people are. Anyway, that is the story of Jack on day 11. Now, he was convicted of, you know, killing me. I seriously have to think he did more. I always say that, but I just, with the, how he did it and how quick he, I mean, he killed three sex workers in Women. five weeks. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's pretty, there is no cooling off time. No. And I'm sure in his little mind, he thought he got away with everything because, hey, I'm, I'm over here and nobody will recognize Well, and some of these women may have gone missing because, as we know, sex workers yeah. are quite the vulnerable lot. So Exactly. Yeah. Who's so and he, he looked the part, too. I mean, he looked like, just look him up. He looked like the part of, not the killer, he looked like the celebrity media literary darling, right? Because he just looked like, I don't know. You know how it plays out. I always think about the, um, is it J.T. Leroy? Is that the one? The fake writer? And it ended up being the writer's brother's wife faked, remember? And they mm. said that they were, mom was a lizard lot and abuse and was like this media literary giant genius at age, I forgot, was it 15 or 16? But it was really the girl's sister-in-law. You know what I'm talking about, right? No, I don't know if I do. JT Leroy, yes you do. JT Leroy, it's a good story. They pulled the wool out everybody's eye. Madonna, all these people. I'll send it to you. So anyway, you know, when something's hot and popular, everybody wants a piece of it. And so right. sometimes I think you look the other way because you're like, oh, OK. Yeah, but it's somebody it's one thing to pretend like you're a literary writer, but it's another thing to pretend to be a literary writer when you've murdered. Oh, people. yeah. But I'm saying I, I just admit that people tend to not. He murdered them all the same way. Right. Now, we do a podcast, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure that that would have been a tip off early on. It was a scumbag. That's not for sure. For sure. All right. That is the close of day 11, Jen. Woo. The, one more to go. Can you believe it? No, one I more. I know it. I've said it before. <sighs> but all right. We hope you guys are enjoying this. We hope everything has settled down. All your packages are wrapped. Everything that can be prepared is prepared. Your cookies are done if you're baking. And we hope it's all smooth sailing from here on out. And you feel free to send me a package at cam at OTCB. You just go ahead and mail it to me. I don't care what it is. I'll mm-hmm. give you Jen's address later. Okay. That'll Courtesy work. of me, I mean. Yeah. All right. Until tomorrow, Jen, remember, lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows. Uh, bye-bye. Look for Rudolph in the sky. Love ya. Today's episode was researched and written by me, Cam. For more information about this episode, as well as all the sources I used, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at ourtruecrimepodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by hosts Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Vertese from We Talk of Dreams. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from October Pod VHS. Our True Crime Podcast is executive produced by Nico Vertese and Dick Bain. Make sure to like and subscribe to Our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at Our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter at Our True Crime Pod. You can email us at Our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. If you really like the show, make sure to check out our Patreon at Our True Crime Podcast. Our True Crime Podcast is an OTC production.